Good afternoon. Um, my name is Veronisa. I'm a professor of medical image analysis at the uh, Erasmus MC in Delft University of Technology and also uh, linked to Quantip, an AI company in medical imaging. And it's also uh, my disclosure. Um, today, I would like to talk about the challenges and opportunities of the things we develop within MICI and how we can really bring them uh, to clinical practice or to uh, support prevention. So uh, disclosure indeed is I'm a uh, founder scientific lead of, uh, of Quantip and still involved there for uh, one day a week. So uh, we know in our field, the big change that came uh, from um, development of these uh, uh, deep learning models in 2012, that the breakthrough came through the ImageNet competition in which we saw that um, the labeling of objects or the recognition of objects and images uh, uh, through neural network uh, outperformed other approaches. And of course, we were doing uh, machine learning types of approaches already for a long time. But since then, many people have worked on, um, on deep learning. And within a few years after the computer vision uh, community, it really uh, picked up big time in the, in the medical imaging community and now in uh, in health as a whole. So the real exciting thing, of course, about these deep learning approaches is that they're not only capable of improving the way we extract quantitative information from image data. So if we want to derive quantitative imaging biomarkers from MR or CT imaging data that are somehow related to disease, we see that uh, the accuracy, the speed at which we can do it has greatly improved because of the use of, uh, of neural networks. But in, in, in addition, we see that increasingly, we're gonna link image data, uh, um, not only uh, to quantitative descriptors of the image, but to relevant clinical outcomes. For example, we wanna do a differential diagnosis, figure out what type of tumor is present or whether a certain therapy would be beneficial for a patient or not. So this really has changed the way we look at our field and increasingly we have more complex inputs, image data with other, kinds, other types of patient information and also more complex outputs, uh, for example, really clinical outcomes. Now, if you look at uh, the reason why uh, the ImageNet competition uh, eventually led to this breakthrough in neural nets, it was really about the availability of a large number of data, labeled data, high quality data. And we know now that um, this is also true in the medical field. We need access to a large uh, data resources and also this challenge aspect in which we compete uh, uh, between different algorithms on clearly defined metrics have been very important in order to advance the field. So I think since a few years, machine learning in medical imaging has become an, an enormous field. And um, we see two types of approaches. The first approach is still going from the image data to quantitative descriptors of the image. And then you uh, build models based on these quantitative descriptors in order to build, for example, clinical decision models. So for example, in cardiovascular disease, you could determine the degree of a stenosis, the presence of calcifications, and then based on that information, try to build a model that says something about the condition of the patient, the diagnosis, a prognosis, etc. And um, one in, in oncology, this field has become very popular, uh, known under the name of radiomics. The idea here is that we can actually calculate many features locally that describe the image content and that somehow this image information is related to the underlying uh, uh, biology, in this case, the underlying tumor biology. And in this way, the idea is to calculate a large number of features and see what combination of features best relates to a specific, uh, 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 specific uh, clinically relevant uh, outcome. For example, again, whether a treatment is going to be successful but also predicting the outcome of a uh, of, uh, uh, pathology. If you, if you look at the pathology specimen, 
and you see the type of tumor, could you predict that directly from the non-invasive imaging experiment and uh, could be in certain cases even avoid a, a, a biopsy? So when we go to the, to the deep learning approach, of course, we, we get rid of the step of uh, trying to compute in between uh, uh, the descriptors of the image, but we uh, go directly from the image data to relevant clinical outcomes. And in certain cases, people have shown that this is uh, actually more accurate and informative because most probably use more, you use more information of the image. So what has this all done? I mean, the fact that we see, especially in our community, and in the journals that we publish in, uh, we see the enormous potential of these approaches. And perhaps uh, there has been a little bit of a of a hype and an uh, even um, uh, anticipated uh, 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 short term gain of these techniques. Uh, one quote I really liked: I saw once in a magazine, "Anything you can do, I can do better." Where uh, I obviously stands for artificial intelligence. So there was quite a big promise that on the short term, all these AI techniques uh, would uh, very quickly uh, change and impact uh, clinical practice. But I myself work in a radiology department, and we see actually that the uptake of AI techniques is, is, is rather slow. So apparently, even though for everyone, it's clear that there's the potential, and. Uh, and, and, and we see definitely an irreversible trend that these technologies are going to change clinical practice. It is not so easy to, to um, introduce these AI techniques at scale at the moment yet. Uh, of course, the field of radiology is among the first of the fields to be uh, impacted by the AI revolution. And that's because uh, much of the AI, AI uh, has been developed in the field of computer vision. So here you see a, a survey which was performed by the American College of Radiology uh, about the current use of AI tools in, in, in uh, radiologists. And you see that uh, increasingly the number of radiologists uh, that use AI is increasing, uh, that their uh, uh, attitude and experience with it is, uh, is positive that uh, uh, sometimes uh, they really indicate it's accurate and valuable, but they have some issues. And the main issues with AI is that they see inconsistent performance and definitely they have very low trust in fully autonomous AI. So the question is, I mean, what, what can we do in order to ensure that AI really brings value to the field of uh, uh, health, to the clinic? To the radiologist and we have to realize that in health we have quite some challenges it's it's not just a computer vision experiment in which we uh, are trying to uh, label an image so um so a lot of research i think has to go into how we combine the the uh, the, the human intelligence with ai a lot of contextual information an ai algorithm is not aware of so uh, certain tasks in the radiological workflow or in clinical decision support, AI has definitely a role, but at the moment, because it's not autonomous, it needs to work very well with human intelligence and how can we uh, optimally complement human intelligence with AI. Then of course, we cannot just uh, uh, look at the image data. In clinical practice, a lot of other information is available clinical information of the patient, a lot of lab data, and increasingly all our high resolution data like omics and genetics data are collected routinely. Then of course, we see an enormous variability in human biology and pathology. And like with any uh, um, approach that learns from data, uh, it's very difficult actually to get access to a large number of uh, health data. And it could be if you get access to data that the data is actually biased and that the biases are built into the system. And if you then try to use a, an approach outside of the domain in which it's trained, it may perform less as you ex had expected. And in the end, of course, everything needs to be seamlessly integrated in the clinical workflow because uh, there, there is in most healthcare systems a shortage of staff. So things shouldn't take longer than, than uh, um, they do now. 
but then the potential is huge. As one example, I think it's very interesting to learn from data and population studies, especially because what we really would like to do is to prevent people from becoming ill. So the vision we have around prevention is that if we could collect data throughout life, we could much better understand why certain people uh, develop well, age healthy, and why other people develop a disease. If we make these data available, we can then do analysis and try, for example, uh, study the relationship between genetic liability for disease, environmental factors, and lifestyle. And this can give us information how to optimize our health. So the way we foresee it is something which is also known in industry as a digital twin. It's a very um, generic concept, but we also have it in health. Suppose we collect a lot of information throughout life, and because we also know what happens to the health or the illnesses of, of, of people, we can build models, and then you can contrast your individual data to these models in order to see whether you're at risk of disease or if you have a disease, what type of treatment could be optimal. So this is really a quite exciting field in which imaging plays a key role. I myself am, for example, quite involved in the Rotterdam study. The Rotterdam study is such a population study in people 45 years and older, and we follow people uh, while they age. We collect uh, all possible kinds of risk factors, and then we follow them up for certain outcomes. For example, we do a lot of brain imaging, and then we're interested in outcomes like whether people develop dementia or get a stroke. And we're doing also routine imaging every three to four years in order to sort of unravel the black box between risk factors and these outcomes, looking at things that are happening to the anatomy of the brain or the presence, for example, of vascular pathologies. So this is really an example in which we uh, have a machine learning approach towards a disease prediction. Uh, this is an example of computing many, many uh, aspects of the brain and trying to be able to, uh, to predict who, for example, gets dementia based on these biomarkers. Now, how do we then bring this to the clinic? And this is an, one of the first examples uh, uh, where we really start to bring this uh, to the clinic. This is a workstation that has um, been developed by, by Quantep. And the idea of this workstation is that you compute a number of biomarkers of the brain that reflect the anatomy of the brain or the presence of vascular pathologies. And because we have such a large population studies, we contrast the individual uh, measurements with the uh, reference population. And in this, uh, in this way, you really make a quantitative report in which you not only quantify aspects of the brain, but you also relate it to a reference population. And this is something which is done very commonly in, in, in the health field. Uh, if you think of uh, blood pressure or BMI, it's very normal to relate those values of an individual to a reference population. But of course, we can also do this with imaging measures. The nice thing about deep learning and our approach is, of course, that we can do much more. We can utilize much more information from the image. And this is one example of a, a network that was developed uh, three years ago by um, a student in our group who build a neural network to predict someone's age from a brain MRI scan. And uh, this led to uh, uh, the fact that we could uh, predict someone's age with a uh, standard deviation of about four to five years. And it doesn't. this doesn't look very good, like very accurate. But then we realized maybe if you are living uh, less healthy, your brain actually looks older than you are. So we developed this novel biomarker, which is the difference between someone's calendar age and like what we coined the biological brain age, which was estimated from the algorithm. And then we checked and followed people over time. And we saw that people whose brain looked older than uh, uh, their actual calendar age were actually at an increased risk of developing dementia. Also, because uh, we, we could visualize those regions of the brain that had most influence in this prediction. So this really also provides novel insights uh, uh, related to, to, to brain aging. 
other examples, of course, of uh, of machine learning and uh, deep learning are in the, in the oncology field. Here you see an example of a uh, radiomics pipeline that's been developed by uh, Martijn Starmans in our group. He saw that we were doing so many uh, experiments in which we tried to uh, compute a set of features and then uh, use a certain classifier in order to uh, optimize a certain task that he felt like we're doing the same experiment over and over again. So he built a whole framework uh, in which you uh, uh, could choose different types of approaches for feature extraction, for uh, applying uh, uh, classification models. And also uh, he developed a, an optimization scheme for a given application in, uh, to, to, to optimize uh, or to, to find the optimal radiomics classifier. So here, and, and this this framework actually has been applied applied by him and by, by many others now on many, many applications. So we see uh, th these are all examples of things that are happening with machine learning, with deep learning in the space of research at a university medical center being presented at the MICAI community. And the question is really, how can we bring this uh, to the clinic? Because some of these things really potentially have large clinical impact. As, as one example here, we look at uh, uh, low-grade gliomas. Of low-grade gliomas, we know there's actually a, a certain genetic uh, subtype that has a better prognosis. And if uh, you could, just based on imaging data, MR imaging data, be able to uh, determine whether in a patient this specific mutation would be present, perhaps you wouldn't have to do a biopsy, which is uh, uh, currently still the, the, the gold standard. So again, an example of a, a method that potentially has a lot of, uh, uh, lo lot of uh, potential. So, so, so now I would like to shift gears a bit and see um, yeah, what is then, if we see all these algorithms and, and we show they're accurate, and sometimes we show that an, an algorithm is, is, is more accurate uh, than a radiologist in doing a, a, a certain diagnosis, or we can see that a method uh, could predict a, a patho pathology outcome with a certain accuracy. How do we really bring this to the clinic? Now, now this is really a, a difficult process, and it typically requires uh, uh, collaboration with, with companies. So we, in 2012, initiated a, a company ourselves, Quantip, and uh, 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 I would like to show some of the uh, uh, the ways of working in a in a company, which are a little bit more structured and formalized compared to the research situation, in order to bring these algorithms of which we have seen the potential to actually bring them uh, to the clinic. And I would like to thank uh, Kurt Metz because uh, most of the slides that I show here are based on a presentation he, he gave a, a while ago. So first, to tell you a little bit more about Quantip. Uh, uh, who, who, who is Quantip? What is Quantip? So we were founded in 2012 as a spin-off company from, uh, from my research group in, in the Erasmus MC. And the reason for that is actually that we were doing a lot of uh, MR brain image analysis, and GE was quite interested in those algorithms, and they were interested to uh, bring them into their uh, workstations. So they basically uh, invested in the development of these products. So they were a, a launching customer. And uh, from there, uh, 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 the, the story of, of, of Quantip began. Uh, we hired a CEO. It was someone who was very uh, uh, well um, uh, aware of the need of quality procedures in making medical devices and medical software. So uh, compared to the situation in a, in a university group, a lot of effort uh, was in creating a, a quality assurance uh, system. And in a, in a few years, we received the ISO certification. And then we developed a, a, a number of products. Uh, at the moment, we have products in the brain and the prostate, uh, um, and uh, they're both FDA cleared. Uh, we have collaborations with many uh, uh, centers and specifically with Utrecht, University Utrecht, uh, next to Erasmus MC, we founded a, a joint venture, QuantipU, 
which now is uh, integrated in, in Quantip again. And uh, the beginning of this year, beginning of 20, 2022, we were actually acquired by Rotnet. So Rotnet is the uh, largest uh, provider of uh, imaging services in uh, radiological imaging services in the US. They have about 360 imaging centers and they want to provide high quality imaging and high quality reporting, which is also AI supported. And uh, they actually acquired by now three uh, AI companies, Deep Health, uh, uh, which worked on uh, breast AI, um, uh, Quantip, which is working on prostate MRI, and Aidens, which is a company in Amsterdam that is working on, on the field of uh, lung cancer. So if you look at uh, uh, Quantip, what is the, the mission of the company? So the, the underlying idea of Quantip really is rooted in the idea of the field of, of, of deep learning, machine learning. If you look here at the expertise of a radiologist, uh, he or she sees more and more cases over the years and gets more and more experienced. So in principle, uh, uh, when they retire, they have, uh, have the, they have the most expertise. And if that at that time they label a number of cases, they, they are of a high quality. Now, our idea is to learn from high quality image data and basically provide algorithms that increase the performance of the radiologist. Maybe we increase the uh, uh, performance most of radiologists that are not experts. Uh, maybe the, the expert radiologist with a tool will eventually also outperform him or herself. So the, the, the question is really uh, how to develop software uh, that really supports radiologists. And uh, we have development in three main areas in, in the brain, in the prostate and in the in the breast. And we do the development in, in, in four steps. So the four main steps in order to develop a high quality uh, software are first related to the data that is needed both for the development and the validation of your approaches. Then there is the actual experimentation, the research, the optimization of the algorithm. Then uh, you have to look at, at how the algorithm is in, integrated into the into the daily workflow of uh, of the radiologist and usability is very important there and finally you have to receive regulatory approval for the product you develop so data i i, I cannot emphasize it enough data is crucial if you don't have large multi-center data sets it's very difficult with the current technology to develop tools that are sufficiently accurate and robust to, 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 to work with. So as a, as a company, you really need to collaborate with multiple centers and uh, you, uh, and, and that's challenging, it's difficult uh, uh, in order to get those data. And, and then you also have to really organize the data because you see data are being acquired differently at different sites. That's also important to know uh, in order to, to, to determine the right level of robustness of your algorithms. Algorithms so you should not just work on data sets that have been acquired with the same field of view or the same resolution or the same contrast settings. So it's, uh, it's important that you have sufficient uh, number of uh, labeled data that are also representative of the heterogeneity of the image data in clinical practice. And we see actually, like in research, that a lot of work goes into, into collecting the data and curating the data prior to algorithm development. The second thing, and that's really related to, uh, to the whole process of quality and also finally getting regulatory approval, it's really important to formulate the, the specific way the algorithm is gonna be used. What is the input and what is the output? And uh, uh, it, it should re really work in certain circumstances. And how is it integrated in the in the in, in the workflow? And you really, uh, th this is really important that you that you very well describe the 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 type of solution you uh, you develop. Once you've done that, then yeah, then you can utilize all the knowledge and all the literature, for example, in the MICI domain. To, to, to choose the right 
type of, of state of the art algorithm and optimize your algorithm for a specific uh, specific task. Uh, and then we go through the steps that, that many of you have gone through in order to iteratively develop and train your algorithm. So um, <clears throat> here is an example. Uh, uh, we've been developing uh, neural networks for the detection of prostate lesions. So, so first we uh, uh, connect to a number of clinical sites and we get their prostate data and we clean the data with the uh, uh, labels. Then we clearly formulate what we would like to do. And this is also a, 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 a very important eventually because the regulatory bodies will ask you what your product claim is. So it's really important to prior to all your experimentation know exactly what are what are what, what your claims will be. We will quantify or we will classify or we will detect. It's important to formulate as clearly as possible what the goal of the algorithm is. Then you utilize a method, you train, you optimize, and you and, and you validate. And validate is of course really important. These algorithms are not going to be used in clinical research or in, in, in clinical uh, or in, in, in research settings. They're really going to be used in, in a clinical setting. So uh, you first do a number of technical uh, 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 validations to look at the re repeatability of your algorithm. You compare the performance with the ground truth. So you provide uh, uh, insight into how accurate the algorithm is. Uh, how often it can possibly fail and of course you also look at the, the speed of the algorithm and the and the ease of use even if it's a brilliant algorithm it doesn't mean it's going to be a success and people will use it you really have to integrate it well user friendliness is important if it takes too much time in order to bring the image data to the solution to get the report then, uh, then, then eventually the radiologist will not use it simply because they have of insufficient time in, in daily clinical practice. So it, it's really important to work towards a seamless integration in the in the workflow in the in, in the hospital. And then, uh, um, then you go for regulatory approval within Europe. Uh, it's CE marking uh, that is mainly uh, focused on. Uh, avoiding uh, uh, risks, doing proper risk management and clinical uh, evaluations. In the USA, USA, you have to get go for FDA clearance, and there it's uh, important that you really show that uh, that the claim you make is substantiated with the evidence you provide, and it really makes a difference in the in, if there's already a similar type of device, of if if you really have a a, a new type of, of device. In any case, think about what you are going to encounter uh, during the regulatory approval, even before starting your product development, because otherwise, at the end of the cycle, you may uh, find you have made wrong choices and you have to do a lot of experiments anew. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so this is really what we're uh, that what we're doing uh, uh, in the end. Uh, in the end, most important in, in, in a product, the difference between a, a research product and a product that you are going to bring on the market is you have to prove that you can deliver what you claim. Of course, the question is then, and then only then it becomes really adopted at scale, does it really uh, uh, add value in clinical practice? It's extremely important that it's safe for the patient and the operator and we have to check that it cannot be uh, compromised. But finally, and I, I have to say as a, as a researcher that has been for many years working on developing algorithms uh, or uh, writing papers, it's very rewarding to see a, a product that is actually going, has gone through all these stages and can then be, uh, uh, yeah, can be installed at many hospitals worldwide uh, and really, uh, yeah, making, the impact that your your that your algorithm has made it from uh, from from a, a, a research proof of concept towards a tool that is going to be used in daily clinical practice. 
So I think it's important that we realize that uh, develop doesn't stop there. So even if you have collected a large number of data sets in order to train your algorithm to optimize it and to validate it, the real validation of your algorithm comes once the product is out there and is being used at a large scale. So um, what we see now, now that we are a little bit a stage further and we have multiple centers in which our tools are employed, you get uh, feedback from users and, and, and the, the process of really improving both the usability, but also the, 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 the underlying accuracy of algorithms, you can really uh, improve it by iteratively uh, updating the, the, uh, the tools and the algorithms based on uh, reports and input from, from the users. So uh, we have really set up a, a network of uh, 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 our partnership with multiple uh, partners around the world in order to be able to, uh, to uh, constantly get feedback uh, on our algorithms to be able to optimize them. The same network we're actually also uh, uh, using in or if we have some research tools to do some first testing we have an ai node platform for that to test some ai solutions to get some feedback whether a certain solution is um, interesting or not so i want to uh, uh, go a little bit more in depth towards the importance of validation i think i stressed that a, a, a real important difference between doing research in the university and building a product is that you really validate that you really slow show how uh, how well your uh, algorithm does but actually as a company you experience that it's quite difficult to get access to data and access to labels in order to actually do this very well and uh, uh, we see in our field of course that since 2007 in the MICAR community, we have uh, organized challenges in which data ha have been made available in order to train a certain task. So that's very important. But I think the access to this type of data uh, needs to be brought uh, even to, uh, to a higher level. And uh, one of the things that I'm excited about over the last couple of years is that we've seen that our community, the MICAR community, it's collaborating increasingly more with the uh, international radiological communities. So we have some collaborations, for example, with the academic uh, uh, college of radiology, with the RSNA, with the European Society of Radiology, in order to uh, to to really work on relevant AI challenges. And 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 I, I think this is the, the way we should develop further. In, in in this respect, I also, I think, should um, mention the, the Grand Challenge website, which is maintained by uh, uh, the Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, a lot of the, uh, they basically provide links uh, to all challenges and also a framework to organize challenges. And I think this is really important because it provides uh, uh, um, uh, the description of specific tasks and the data uh, and provides the data and the uh, and, uh, evaluate, evaluation metrics to, to validate different approaches. So the, the collaboration with between MICAI and these, these radiological professional societies is important in the sense that we would like those challenges to more and more be based on what the clinical end user needs. And uh, the Data Science Institute of the American College of Radiology a few years ago has uh, a, 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 a launched the touch ai directory and it's a directory of all kinds of use case scenarios in which uh, artificial intelligence may help to improve medical imaging care so what i think is that actually these use cases sh should be supported with data and and this uh, requires uh, health data infrastructure also the COVID crisis has learned us that we would like to 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 be able to learn from real world data as fast as we can and we see that there's a lot of challenges in order to do that. There's challenges with respect to the legal legal basis of reuse. As, as, as someone provided the consent to use the data. But there's also the problem that data are very scattered and that they are being stored in different form. And uh, what, what, what really 
uh, would be we, we would like to achieve is that we build a, an infrastructure which makes it easier to learn from real world data in order to develop and validate our AI algorithms. In the Netherlands, we have uh, launched a, a, an approach for that. Uh, it's called Health RI, Health Research Infrastructure. The idea is to uh, build a health data infrastructure for reuse of data for research and innovation uh, with, with the idea to build a, a learning healthcare system. So it's centered up around regional nodes. Most of the regional nodes are university medical centers and uh, uh, the regions around them. So the general practitioners and other institutes. And the idea is that these regional nodes are the places where data are collected. And there's a hub where you can search for the data over multiple regional nodes. You can request access to that and uh, you can start to do analytics based on the data. So we see that in order to, to build such an infrastructure, there's a, actually a lot of hurdles. It's not easy to build a learning healthcare system over multiple institutes. And we've identified a number of hurdles and uh, uh, these hurdles are in, in, in different, uh, uh, different domains, but uh, roughly so some part of the hurdles are related to legal and ethical issues. So related to be able to get the, the consent of a patient or a citizen to use the data, or is it possible to link data from the same individual if it's collected at different places? The second challenge is on the actual infrastructure. So here we are uh, focusing on ensuring that data are harmonized such that they can be pooled and on a federated infrastructure such that we can access the data at multiple sites. And of course, it should be user friendly eventually to search request for the data and being able to run analytics. So what does the envisioned health RI architecture uh, look like? So we're looking broader than the imaging data. Again, if we wanna improve diagnostics and prognostics, we need to have also clinical information about the patient. We need to know the outcome of the patient. And if there's lab data or genetics or omics data, it's also relevant. So uh, we, uh, uh, we are making agreements on the different standards that are being used for these type of data. And we're uh, uh, sharing tools in order to bring the real world data from clinical practice into common data formats. Then the data can stay locally, but information about the data is shared with a, a, a catalog, which is central. And from this catalog, a portal can be built. And in this way, a user who would like to access certain data for a certain question, you, for example, you would like to develop an AI algorithm based on uh, uh, scans of the liver, plus some clinical information to predict a certain outcome, then uh, you are you should be able to query which data are available at which regional nodes. And then there is a data governance uh, procedure in order to determine if you can get access to these data. So we are working towards a national find and request portal that knows uh, where which data are available and whether they have been standardized or not. And then once you have uh, 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 you know that such data are available, uh, we can provide access to these data, for example, for a federated analysis, uh, uh, federated learning, developing deep learning uh, models. So I, I, so this is really crucial. I think if we can build this kind of infrastructure, so if we allow an individual hospital to organize their data such that they can let the hub know we have these data available, and if we have a data management and data governance uh, above it, that we know under what conditions the data can be used, then for many uh, parties, both in academia, but also in the industry, the threshold in order to get access to data, uh, uh, which are really representative for the heterogeneity of clinical practice becomes much lower. And that will definitely increase uh, uh, both the quality of algorithms, but also the quality of validation studies of algorithms. So this is really something which I think is crucial for us to make impact with AI in medicine. So what I think what we should be working on 
is really to work uh, uh, towards higher quality and better accessible data, both for science and innovation, so both for research and academia and for industry. And crucial is there that we work towards standards. We make data FAIR. FAIR is an acronym which stands for data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So I think that is really important. And these FAIR data should be accessible through a federated uh, network. I think at the moment, uh, the clinical practice, there's too much heterogeneity in data uh, uh, collection and in the primary clinical process, it would be good if there was, uh, is going to be more standardized data collection to increase the quality of the data. Then second, I think we have to clearly define use cases uh, in which AI has a benefit for the clinician and we should build a, a clear challenges around that. And these challenges can then be uh, uh, organized with these rich data of this uh, fair data network. Then I think this will lead to algorithms that are going to be FDA approved, CE marked, that are already going to be well performing. But I think we have to continuously improve and update on these algorithms using the feedback from the real world use. And indeed, this really is, a, is an effort of co-creation. This is really only going to work if people, AI researchers like the run from the clinical community, work together with clinicians, with clinical research, and where academic sites and industry work together. And in this way, the, the enormous promise from uh, AI algorithms will actually lead to uh, um, products in daily clinical practice that can, can improve the quality of diagnosis, of prognosis, and really then we can fulfill the promises of AI in medicine. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy uh, to, and after the talk, there is a discussion with the live uh, questions and answering, and any questions you may have, I'm very happy to, to address it.